Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and I'm really looking forward to another individual study with you today focused on Chicago outfit loan shark and killer Sam DeStefano. Violent, merciless, psychotic, and an alleged devil worshipper, DeStefano is one of the worst men if not the worst man in the Chicago outfit and that is saying a lot given his competition. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please make sure to head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Samuel DeStefano Jr. was born on September 13, 1909 in Streeter, Illinois to Italian immigrants Salvatore Samuel DeStefano Sr. and Rosalie A. Brasco DeStefano. They had moved to America from the old country in 1903. His father worked a variety of jobs and his mother was a homemaker. DeStefano was the fourth of the couple's six children, four boys, two girls. We'll discuss some of the trouble that DeStefano had between his brothers later in the episode. Shortly after DeStefano's birth, the family moved to Heron, Illinois, where his father found work as a coal miner. He had been working this job for about a decade when the Heron massacre took place in 1922. In this massacre, union strikes got out of hand and coal miners on the union strike killed several of the strike breakers. As a result, the family headed to Little Italy in Chicago. DeStefano's father would find work as a laborer and later open a produce market. He would eventually become a real estate salesman. Sam DeStefano, however, would not follow in his father's footsteps. Instead, he would pursue a career in crime, finding work with Chicago's West Side Gang. Already in jail by 17 years old, he would be arrested in Chicago on September 12, 1926 for breaking out. By July of 1927, hundreds of his West Side associates would show up to threaten and protest the arrest. At the point of DeStefano's arrest, officers had also shot and killed another West Side member. In November of 1927, DeStefano and associate Ralph Orlando would be arrested and found guilty for kidnapping and raping a 17-year-old girl on August 19th. However, since the police were able to intervene before DeStefano could move forward with this act, it was reduced to sexual assault, which got him three years behind bars, not nearly long enough. Upon his release in 1930, DeStefano would join the 42 gang where a young Sam Giancana reigned supreme. With this crew, DeStefano would get involved in the grunt work of bootlegging and gambling operations run by Al Capone. In 1932, DeStefano arrived at a West Side hospital with multiple bullet wounds. When asked what happened, he refused to say. However, we were able to find out later that he was involved in a police shootout following a grocery store robbery. On July 10, 1933, DeStefano robbed a bank in Wisconsin. For this crime, he would be found guilty and sentenced to 40 years. And that was the end of him, right? <laughs> Obviously wrong. Normally, a 40-year prison sentence would have been the end of the story for a mobster, but not in DeStefano's case. DeStefano would be released after serving only 11 years behind bars in 1944. He was released by Wisconsin's governor, Walter Samuel Goodland. Goodland had taken office in 1942 after the elected governor, Orland Steen Loomis, had died of a heart attack one month before taking office. In the next election, Goodland would run on his own and win. Although it cannot be proven, I suspect strong political corruption here. And I wonder if Governor Goodland ever felt responsible for the victims DeStefano left behind by approving this early release. Upon his release, DeStefano pretended to be on the straight and narrow for a very short time when he worked at a printing plant. He would meet his wife, Anita, a seamstress, on February 15, 1945. They were wed soon after. Anita would give birth to twins that year, and in 1947, the couple would have a daughter. DeStefano's marriage to Anita was a disaster, and I'll be sharing some of the more colorful stories with you a little bit later on in this episode. In one instance, however, DeStefano forced her to place the barrel of a gun into her mouth and pull the trigger to kill herself. When she did, no bullet came, and DeStefano laughed. He had taken the bullets out. Despite a growing family, access to printing materials would prove too tempting to DeStefano's criminal sensibilities, and he would find himself behind bars again after selling 6,000 counterfeit sugar stamps to a local distributor. This time, he would be sent to the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, where he would meet and befriend Paul Rica. DeStefano's time in the federal pen proved to be the most important thing to ever happen to his criminal career. Throughout his life, DeStefano would be convicted of several crimes, including assault with a deadly weapon, bank robbery, extortion, and possession of counterfeit stamps. But it wasn't until he got involved with Shylocking that he really hit his stride. Shylocking is one of the largest money makers for organized crime, second only to gambling. But if gambling is organized crime's number one money maker, it makes sense that loan sharking would be in second place as people need money to gamble. Loan sharking or Shylocking is the business of giving out high interest loans with the threat of violence or death should the debt not be repaid. 
usually within an unreasonable amount of time. DiStefano ran the traditional loan sharking racket, but was creative in how he incorporated that into his legal briberies as well, and this only added to his self-aggrandizement. He believed he was smarter than all of the other members of the outfit, but the truth is, he was insane. In fact, there are multiple reports that describe him as literally foaming at the mouth. To add insult to injury, he was also reported to have worshipped Satan, sometimes writhing on the floor and begging Satan to be merciful to him, repeating, I'm your servant, command me. All of this feeds into his mafia and media nickname, Mad Dog or Mad Sam. It seems that DeStefano was more than just an outfit sadist, which is scary enough, but that the man was troubled mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. De Stefano had brought his brothers Mario and Michael into the world of organized crime. Mario was extremely successful, almost as sadistic, and ultimately able to outwit Sam, but we'll talk about that at the end. But Michael would become a victim of heroin addiction. Due to this, De Stefano was ordered by the outfit to take Michael out. De Stefano carried out the hit, but in what I suppose was his form of being humane. De Stefano shot his brother in the body instead of the face. The body was then cleaned up and placed in the trunk of a car in an obvious location to be sure that this body was found quickly and cut down on the decay for the funeral. Michael De Stefano's body was discovered on September 17, 1955. One of De Stefano's earliest muscle men was William Action Jackson, a very large man and a Shylock collector who was known for his violence and mercilessness, just the type of man with whom De Stefano would find a kinship. In 1961, De Stefano began to suspect that Jackson had begun working with the FBI. Wasting no time, he had his men kidnap Jackson and bring him to the meatpacking plant, where they hung him on a meat hook and tortured him horrifically. I won't get into too many details, but cattle prods, hammers, baseball bats, ice picks, and blow torches were all murder weapons in this case. For three days, Jackson was tormented this way until his heart gave out on August 11th, 1962. His body was stuffed into the trunk of a Cadillac and found by police soon after. William Jackson was never an FBI informant. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, De Stefano had taken Tony Spilatro under his wing and taught him the ways of loan sharking, violence, and brutality. Spilatro was an exemplary pupil and by 1962 would be responsible for the Eminem murders we have covered extensively on this show. Another element that should be added, however, is that McCarthy and Miraglia also owed money to the loan shark De Stefano. They were in deep trouble with the outfit, and murdering two outfit associates and the women they were with only sealed their fate faster. In the home De Stefano had built for his wife and three children, he included a basement torture chamber. It was completely soundproof, and he had a variety of razors and ice picks with which to torture his victims. One of the victims was restaurant owner Arthur Adler, who had fallen behind on his payments. De Stefano had tortured and murdered him in his basement and dumped the body in a nearby sewer. The victim's body was later found on March 28, 1960, when the sanitation company was working to unblock a backed up sewer. De Stefano is reported to have laughed about this for days. This torture basement was used for a variety of his most grotesque crimes, some of which I will be sharing with you today, but most of which I will not be. Make no mistake that De Stefano was an unhinged maniac. If you'd like to look at some of the more grotesque stories, I do have my sources linked in the description, but just be warned that some of the things that I read made me physically ill and the things that I've included in this episode are the tamest of his crimes. Typically, this type of neurotic behavior would have disqualified him from any real involvement with the outfit. However, De Stefano was so competent in his work that men like Tony Accardo, Paul Rica, and Sam Giancana would invest $100,000 into his Shylock operations. De Stefano was involved in real estate and even owned an apartment complex he used to create a legitimate income, plus the money he had left over from the Wisconsin bank robbery. He worked as a political fixer, paying off robbery and assault charges. He had even allegedly paid off a murder charge for 20 grand. The corruption was so bad that many of the CPD officers would not take arrested people to the police station, but rather to De Stefano's house to collect their payment. De Stefano didn't get nothing from this, however. The criminals that he got off the hook with the police were now on the hook to repay De Stefano's payoff with interest. The arrested criminals went from getting caught by the police to owing money to a ruthless loan shark. For context, De Stefano's interest rates were between 20 and 25 percent per day by the mid-1960s when he was the top loan shark in the city. Something else De Stefano was known to do was factor in an alibi for himself when giving the loans. With the money, De Stefano would often give a golden watch with his name inscribed on the back. If these borrowers found themselves beaten or killed and the law were to ask De Stefano about this, he would simply say, look, they have a watch that was given to them, it has my name on it. It was a pretty good alibi. Most of the stories about the sadistic nature of De Stefano come from government witness Charles Cremaldi. Cromaldi worked as muscle for De Stefano alongside Tony Spilatro. In 1963, Cromaldi and Spilatro had been the men who led Leo Foreman, 
a real estate broker and DeStefano Shylock borrower, to his death in DeStefano's torture basement. Foreman was beaten, hit with a hammer, ice-picked, and shot by Spilaccio Cromaldi DeStefano and his little brother Mario DeStefano before Foreman was finally finished off with a butcher knife by Sam DeStefano. His body would be placed in the trunk of a car and left at the end of an empty street. This murder would end up being DeStefano's Achilles heel. Federal law enforcement had their sights set on DeStefano. On May 4, 1964, he was summoned to court after being charged for voting in an election. Since he was a convicted felon, he did not have that right any longer. It's in this case that we get the famous pictures of De Stefano lying in a hospital bed with a bullhorn. For his court dates, De Stefano made a mockery of the criminal proceedings, showing up in a hospital bed, wearing pajamas, and insisting that he give his testimony through a bullhorn. He even tried to represent himself in court, but the judge refused. Upon the judge's refusal, De Stefano became erratic, and the judge told him to be quiet, to which De Stefano replied, I'll show you how quiet I can be, and began screaming into his bullhorn. He was charged thrice for contempt of court, as I'm sure you can imagine. For each of the contempt convictions, De Stefano was given one year behind bars, but the judge declared a mistrial for the voting charge since the jury could not come to a decision. De Stefano had fantasized about owning a pig farm so that he could easily dispose of bodies by feeding them to his pigs. He was known to drive to pig farms and watch the swine for hours, dreaming of what could be. Grimaldi would also help De Stefano almost kill his wife. One day when De Stefano was very angry with her, he had Grimaldi help him tie her up and shove her into the trunk to drive her out into the country, murder her, and bury her. Fortunately for Anita, their children returned home and the entire plot paused so that they would not be witnesses. Later, De Stefano's anger settled and he called off the hit. Once, when De Stefano had suspected his wife of cheating, he drove out, kidnapped a random man at gunpoint, and brought him back to the house. He then forced Anita to perform oral sex on this man. The man left and went straight to the authorities, but when questioned, both Sam and Anita De Stefano denied that any such thing had occurred. And as if this man could not get any worse, De Stefano also seemed to have a fascination with torturing people with urine. According to a story by Frank Collada, De Stefano's lawyer was unable to achieve his goal, so after De Stefano had finished verbally berating him, he urinated on him, and the lawyer thanked him for not killing him instead. There are other instances in which De Stefano instructed people to urinate on victims, specifically one unfortunate restaurant owner and De Stefano collector named Peter Capaletti, who stole $25,000 from De Stefano and tried to make a run for Milwaukee. De Stefano and his men found Capaletti in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, brought him back to Chicago, Illinois, and tortured him mercilessly. I'm not going to get into the really gruesome details, but let's just say that after being tortured, tied to a radiator and urinated on, that Capaletti paid the money back. In fact, he paid back $50,000. And finally, according to FBI agent William Romer, when he had gone to the DiStefano home to investigate various crimes, starting with the murder of Arthur Adler but continuing for many years, Anita DiStefano had offered him a cup of coffee. It had a peculiar taste. Romer asked about it, and Anita said that it was a special type of Italian coffee. Anita would often have to wake her husband for these FBI interviews as he slept in late. In this particular instance, De Stefano came down wearing pajamas with the fly open, fully exposing himself to Romer for the questioning. Later, it was revealed that De Stefano had been urinating in the coffee maker. Romer said that he was never able to drink coffee again. Me neither, Bill. That's disgusting. De Stefano was also paranoid. He trusted no one. He would have his wife taste test any food that he ate, including the food that she made for him. He also insisted while driving on four-lane roads that he remain in the leftmost lane to cut down on the chance that a vehicle could pull up beside him and shoot him. Another peculiar thing that he did was pretend that he was visually impaired. He wore thick glasses and always claimed that he could not see without them. When people were near, he would remove his glasses to give them a sense that he could not see what they were doing, but he could see everything. In 1973, FBI agents were able to flip Charles Cromaldi to their side and get him to testify about his former boss regarding the murder of Leo Foreman. Soon, De Stefano, his brother Mario, and Tony Spilatro were all arrested for the murder. Naturally, De Stefano was furious and wanted Cromaldi dead, and of course, he was acting like a lunatic. A member of the press had asked De Stefano about his brother, and he lost it, saying, touch me, but don't touch my brother. I don't like it when you touch my brother. Don't you look cross-eyed at my brother. Then I became what they call me, a raving maniac. Do I make myself clear? That statement was all the boss Tony Accardo needed to hear in order to make the call to take De Stefano out. On April 14th, 1973, Mario De Stefano telephoned his brother and let him know that he and Tony Spilatro had found out where the FBI was keeping Charles Cromaldi, and they would be over to pick up De Stefano soon to drive him there, and De Stefano agreed. When Mario De Stefano and Tony Spilatro arrived at De Stefano's home, where he waited in the garage, Spilatro pulled out a double barrel shotgun, shooting De Stefano once in the arm, nearly blasting it off of his body, and again in his chest, killing him. 
No one was ever charged for the De Stefano murder. De Stefano's children would go into hiding and obscurity. Samuel De Stefano Jr. was buried at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing probably the worst man in the Chicago outfit, Sam De Stefano. De Stefano certainly made a name for himself, but he serves as an important reminder that as fun as it is to fantasize about the more glamorous aspects of organized crime, that it was actually filled with psychopaths, murderers, and some of the worst men in the entire population. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Sam DeStefano and some of the stories that you've heard. Also, don't forget to utilize the comment section and social media to let me know who you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your soapbox. Ciao!